Okay. Aloha, everybody, and thank you for coming for joining us for HLA's Next Step program. Today's program is, is one of two part work, free workshops in collaboration with HLA's Centennial Committee on how to research local library history. Our speaker today is Andrew B. Wertheimer. He is an Associate Professor of Library and Information Science at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He is the co-chair of HLA's Centennial Committee and previously served for a decade as HLA's ALA Chapter Counselor. He teaches the history of libraries and information as well as other areas in library and archival studies. Wertheimer has a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in LIS with a doctoral minor in print culture studies and an MLS from Indiana University. He's a past chair of the ALA Library History Roundtable and the ALISE Information History SIG. He served on the editorial boards of Libraries, Culture, History, and Society, Library History, and the Library Quarterly. Along with Do Donald T. Davis Jr., he co-edited Library History Research in America, essays commemorating the 50th anniversary of the ALA. Without further ado, this is Andrew Wertheimer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Sharice. So um, I really appreciate that all of you came, and, and I know that um, Sharice is going to mention later. But um, again, this is the second. Uh, this is the first part of uh, a workshop um, that we're trying to get all of you to help to go and um, um, reuse your historical chops to go and um, help to tell our story um, for the centennial of the uh, HLA, and and also to tell the, the the narrative of librarianship here in Hawaii. So so today we're going to focus on oral history. Next um, time in August we're going to talk about um, more about the craft of of writing it up and and how to go about that. And and again, this whole purpose is. Um, we're going to try to come out with a uh, OER uh, scholarly collection, you know, trying to share some of our stories about the diverse uh, history of, of libraries, uh, archives, school library, media centers, all of us in Hawaii. So celebrating all of these histories, um, building on what you heard at the um, spring conference from Dr. Glenn about, you know, uh, empowering, you know, un under un untold stories. And, you know, part of that also is going to try to inspire other cool folks to go and join us in the LAS program and, and then to become uh, practitioners and members so that we can inspire um, uh, folks. So um, with, with that said, so today we're going to, I'm going to give you a tiny, um, I feel it's going to be a whole semester course, but we, I have like 45 minutes and I'm trying to keep it to like 25 minutes and leave some time for Q&A. But um, just a little bit about the history of oral history, um, some of the associations and journals in case you're interested, why you as a librarian or an archivist should understand or appreciate oral history. And then um, I'm going to give you some practical steps because that's really what it's about is uh, making it happen. And then a little bit of ethics and then we'll have time for Q and A. So, um, history of oral history, and it sounds like a mouthful, um, it began with um, you know, the early days were big monster machines. You can see in the in the top right of the corner the um, early reel to reel um, recording. So this was at Columbia University. You know, the, the the tapes were really fragile. They had specialists. This was considered state of the art, and um, it was expensive. And people came out of uh, history programs, and the idea was to go and you know record elites like cabinet members or um, and you know so it was to go and you know continue to tell basically traditional history, but using the kind of that time new technology. So again, that's right after immediate post-war period. The more exciting thing, which I, I think a lot of us in oral history uh, came to it was, well, there wasn't when I first came to it, I was listening to other tapes, but um, in, in, in the in the uh, 60s and 70s, you know, we had in Hawaii, we have the Hawaii Renaissance, you know, of course, there's the anti-war movement, you know, the um, all of the um, civil rights movement and um, uh, gay, lesbian, um, you know, talking about all sorts of freedom and kind of changing identity and all of, you know, uh, stories which hadn't been told. Think about the the book and TV show Roots. And, you know, so again, people who hadn't had their story 
written, we're now trying to go and record it. And um, a big part of that was that tape players became a lot smaller, tapes were cheap and, and, and they're portable. So you don't need to be an elite. You could record um, working class history, um, and, 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 and again, so that you could try to, this, this became sort of like the activist um, end of kind of oral history and um, actually it still carries a lot of the idea today. So again, here in, in, in Hawaii, Warren Nishimoto worked with the Oral History Center, so lives of people who were on plantations. You can see some of the bound volumes of that, um, you know, union activity, women's history, LGBTQIA+. Um, and, and for me, I became really interested in Japanese, um, because I was interested in Japanese American history. A lot of that was developed with, uh, or kind of retold using oral history methods. So um, Art Hansen at Cal State Fullerton created a, uh, oral History Center and was really good about trying to record different types of voices about um, especially the, the forced uh, internment or the, the relocation of uh, forced relocation of Japanese Americans during World War II. Um, so technology and social change are kind of driving a lot of oral history and so um, by the 2000s we have the next kind of like major change in oral history um, and that was you know because um, video and um, computers. So um, you have, um, you may recognize the, the guy in the middle. Um, so Spielberg um, in, in endowed uh, um, the uh, USC Shoah Foundation. And they had this amazing dream of using, um, you know, creating video interviews in, in whatever language a Holocaust survivor. Uh, would have spoken and then to be able to transcribe, to translate, to make it so that you could do a computer search. So like, let's say you're interested in libraries, in ghettos, in, you know, these communities. So in Lithuania or any, so you could run through the mainframe, it would be able to pull up parts of an oral history. Um, and, and at that time, uh, UCLA at the iSchool, um, was working with them and creating metadata and trying to think about how you can search it. Um, so it's some, um, yeah, thank you for the link. So um, really interesting opportunities. Actually, when I was uh, applying for a doctoral program, I almost uh, worked there if I had gone to my PhD at, at UCLA. Um, but it was really, the, the Shoah Foundation was right, right off of um, um, Hollywood. And so you're driving around in those kind of like little golf trucks that they do in Hollywood. Anyway, it was amazing. Some really uh, interesting people. Um, another thing that's kind of related to um, Holocaust and this kind of like idea of historical um, interest is that um, there's a French film called Shoah. I think, yes, yeah, yeah, nine plus hours. So I imagine not many of you have seen it, but um, it, it kind it was again, trying to change the idea of what is, Kind of a national narrative. So, for example, a lot of people in France thought that France was kind of, was innocent and occupied by the Germans. But like part of what the Shoah movie told was a story of like French cooperation with the Holocaust. And so we you talk about the politics of memory or memoir, and to say that you know so we have human memory, but we also have national memory and oral history. Um, in, a, in addition to using documents, is a great way to try to challenge the national constructs that we had, who won an election, what happened with COVID. These are all kinds of things that, that happened, you know, and, and that we can use oral history as a, as a way of trying to tell a story. So um, his oral historians, um, like all historians, you know, worry about reliability. So I, I think all of us know, like, yes, I remembered it to take out the trash yesterday. Okay, right. So our, our memory is sometimes fallible, uh, fallible. Um, you know, especially as we go further and we oftentimes like to see ourselves in a better um, point of view. So, you know, it's really important that you try to triangulate those kinds of things. And so for that reason that some historians still don't like oral history and they, you know, will have, you know, I only go by written documents, but now we're much more, as long as you're able to triangulate it and to show other sorts of evidence that, you know, you have, um, that it's still uh, useful. And, and there's still, like I said, within all of academia, there's um, a kind of um, different attitudes towards oral history. So like when I was getting my PhD, 
um, most of the people came out of traditional social science and they were really wary of doing oral histories. <laughs> they, they felt like anytime you work with humans, it's introducing bias. And so they wanted me to have like a fixed survey instrument that I would give to everyone and that you shouldn't have personal interactions with, and, and because the idea is that you wanted to minimize bias at any time that you do a, a, an interview. But um, more postmodern, you know, I think that um, uh, uh, scholars recognize that, you know, every, all of us as individuals, as scholars, we have bias, the system is biased. Um, and there's certainly, you know, uh, systems tend to reward some over others. So part of our challenge as an oral historian is to try to understand that and to figure out how we can do that. And uh, many are kind of more activists. And we'll talk about how can we try to um, tell these kind of untold stories? How can we highlight uh, oppression? How can we um, try to bring all of these things and, and to unpack these narratives? You know, maybe... Um, like one of my favorite stories is there's a historian, Roger Daniels, who was telling, uh, teaching a class about the Japanese American experience. And he talked about how there were no Japanese Americans in you know, the West Coast you know, right after the war. And he said, well, I was, I was born there. My parents told me this story because they had never told him the story about the, this is a few decades ago, obviously, but they had never told the story about the, the internment. And so again, you know, that he had this in his mind um, and had to later try to un unpack. This is what I'm talking about in terms of um, you know, the, the larger methodology. So, um, and re re related to that, of course, there's a lot of really interesting work on indigenous research methods. And, you know, a lot of them build on, um, you know, like host cultures being uh, oral cultures. So I, I, I apologize, I'm really zipping through, like I said, a lot of this could be a whole semester of, of discussion, but, um, as I tell my students, I know many of you are former students, I always feel like this is kind of like uh, taking you to the buffet table in non-COVID times and letting you kind of graze if there's things that you're interested in. That's why I'll start out with some of the associations. So um, I know we, when we think of OHA in Hawaii, we certainly have a different idea, but um, in uh, oral histories, that's the Oral History Association. It's a great association to be involved with. They set up standards. Um, they have a code of ethics we'll look at. They also have their own journal, which you see here, um, and, but they're not the only game in town. So there are other uh, journals as well dealing with oral history. Um, so just really quick, um, plug. So even if you're not going to join us on this uh, fantastic journey of crafting, uh, our, telling our own history or history, um, you as a librarian or archivist should be uh, encouraging oral history because, like I said, it, it helps to document unwritten stories, women, um, BIPOC, you know, uh, classes. Um, there, there is a, when I was in Wisconsin, there was an oral history um, collection at the State Veterans Museum, and they talked about how most of the, or, most of the history is written from the perspective of generals, and they tried to say, well, if you interview veterans, or if you imagine how different the story is, like, you know, someone who's a grunt, you know, a low-level soldier on the field, or imagine a civilian. Um, you know, again, so our perspectives change and, and oral, most of the documents are written by elites and, and, you know, those are the people whose institutions capture their stories. So oral history can complement these, can complement existing collections that we have. Um, it can help even whether you're talking about elites or, or person on the street, it helps us to reflect critically. You know, we, we have evidence that says someone did something, but we can ask in oral history, why did you do that? What did you think about it? What were the responses? Um, again, oral um, narration is really uh, key in, in Hawaii. So and we know that um, the stories of uh, creation stories, you know, tie people to, you know, their role within society, to, you know, creation, to uh, connections with everyone. So uh, again, it's really important. Um, linguists, as I'll talk about in a second, are really interested in capturing uh, actual speech acts, so dialect, words and context. Um, and again, we're, when we're doing oral history, we're much less likely to censor ourselves. So um, un unlike if we were to write like a diary or um, so. And again, it just by, by being involved in the act of doing oral history, it helps us to use our collections to become a researcher. Um, and also, I think, 
it helps us to understand our own professional um, development. And beyond that, if any of you are interested in creating digital exhibits, digital libraries, digital archives, or even the physical you know, um, exhibit spaces, you having audio or video can really make a dynamic um, exhibition. So again, um, we're doing this um, for the Centennial Project. So I'd love um, for you to go and email me if you're interested in trying to do an article or to do an oral history. Um, like I said, in August, we'll have another seminar about that. And you can think about what sort of product that you want to create. Do you want to just do a transcript? Do you want to do um, a paper or a presentation? Do you want to write a, a full on biography? Does this want to be, a, do you want to create an institutional history? Um, a lot of what historians will look at is that what is your, um, the time period or the subject that you want to focus on? So again, like with the closing of Sinclair Library, maybe that might be an interesting story or the development of the Wong Center or, um, or you could look at a tight, a tight time period like the Hamilton Library flood or, and recovery. So again, you think about periodizations and these will help you to think about like who you, you choose. Um, or the Manoa um, Public Library when they, um, the whole process of creating a new library and working with lead developers in the community. Anyway, these are all kind of interesting projects that you could um, think about doing. So again, encourage you to think about sort of bite-sized pieces. Um, so in, in those of you who don't know, my, my undergraduate degree was in journalism. And so we actually had a whole course on interviewing. And um, so journalists, as if, if any of you have had interactions with them, they will have a really tight, narrow focus and um, you know, maybe interview you, what did you do on this act? And hopefully they'll spell everything correctly and get your quote correct. Um, you know, it's a really short time. Oral history, we actually try to call it life history. So we wanna spend a lot of time researching, analyzing, and not just looking, even if I was interested in the, the short period of the Manoa Public Library modeling, if I was doing a life history with someone, I'd want to know from birth to their, 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 their period now. And I would spend a lot of time researching and interviewing. And, and again, different disciplines are going to look at it different ways, as I said. So and, and journalists, there's different ethics, like dealing with confidentiality. You, your source may be trying to deceive you much more. Um, like broadcast media, oftentimes they're just looking for a soundbite, um, you know, that they can run with the news. A linguist is going to be looking much more at what were the actual words and dialect, you know, how was uh, Alelo Hawaii different on Lanai? What are the words that are, or Hawaii Creole English, or anyway, different kinds of things. Or as uh, another uh, field anthropologists also do field research. Um, and I think we can learn from these different fields because they're often really interested in um, ethnographic um, uh, research and, and they are much more reflective on what is their role as a participant in this. But regardless of what discipline you came from or you're trying to look at, there are a lot of tips that you can use such as like alternating tough and uh, easy kind of we say softball questions. Um, you know, that you're trying to be looking for the narrative or the story, you're wanting to capture people's language and thoughts, you want them to reflect on things, not just say, yes, this library was built in 1974, and then go on to the next topic. How did that, would it, there was the environmental movement then, but did the library reflect, you know, so again, and also you want to be ethical and um, if so. Um, Obviously, a really key thing that you need to think about in terms of practicalities is who are you going to choose? So um, I, one of my first oral history efforts was with my grandmother. Okay, she was going through Alzheimer's at that time and everything came to, you know, I was talking with some thingamajigger about, th okay, so you want to, don't do that. <laughs> that's really frustrating. So you want someone with a, with a that's not my grandmother, that's Dr. Van, by the way, so um, who had an amazing memory. So um, you, you'll want to find someone who has some time that can dedicate to working with you, that they have a good memory, some, someone with expertise, and someone who has integrity that they'll tell you the honest story. Um, if you're trying to find your subject, you know, um, think about talking with your colleagues, talk, um, you know, some, we, we know the Coconut Wireless Network here will help you to think about who might be a really good person if you have an idea of some subject. So and you might want to think about like, do I want to interview 
pioneering Kanaka Ma Ma Maori, Maoli, Maori, sorry, Kanaka Ma Native Hawaiian librarian? Uh, or do you want to try to, like in Dr. Van, a kind of pioneering LIS professor? Or who would help you to try to tell your story? Um, again, I, I apologize for zipping through, but um, next kind of practical thing you can think about is your uh, equipment. So back when I started, I used tape recorders. So analog, you know, the advantage was, you know, I could make duplicates of things. I would, they were inexpensive, um, but, you know, of course, the, the, they're getting pretty rare right now. So, um, and you can do so much more with digital equipment because you can transcribe um, using digital materials so much easier. Um, but whatever you do, um, back up, back up, back up. So make sure that you don't, you know, add, it's, it's all too easy when you have a digital or even an analog file to tape over something. So, you know, be really careful working with what you do. Um, look at, um, you know, can you get noise reduction? Think about your microphone. There's all sorts of different types and it depends on what type of interview you might wanna do. Do you have like something that's wired? Do you have um, like on a video camera, they might have like a parabolic or they call it a, a gun mic. Um, and don't forget those kind of fuzzy things that can cover. So if you're breathing into the mic or if you're outside and it's windy, um, you know, those can try to minimize some of the problem. And whatever you do, make sure that you bring extra batteries, memory cards, or maybe even come up with a, an additional option if something goes wrong. I once went to San Francisco to do an interview and my, my tapes were out and my batteries were out. And it, it was a matter I actually had to, uh, and it had arrangement with like two different people to make this happen. And I had to run out to like a convenience store to go and grab batteries. It makes everyone kind of fluster and it's a kind of bad start. So. Of course, you can add video um, that makes for more dynamic um, if you wanted to go and use it in a, in a web. Um, but if you're starting out, I would really encourage you not to do that. Most, most of us, well, maybe, be, maybe COVID, we're a little bit more natural in front of the camera, but um, usually, especially as we get older, um, we tend to be a little bit more um, careful in terms of when we're on, on the video. And we also are much more likely to censor ourselves if we feel like it's video. So, um, and there also, you need much more equipment. You need to think about the lighting. Um, and um, sometimes even people will have other people focusing on audio and, and video. And um, again, I'm assuming our, our budget for this is bupkis. So, um, you know, let's, yeah. So whatever you do, I would encourage you to try to do a practice interview that gives you a chance. So not with your subject, but, you know, talk with your partner, don't do the cat. It's really hard to get good, good feedback, but um, check, test out your equipment, um, practice ways of trying to go and um, find ways of like do follow, doing follow-up questions so that you feel more natural with that. Or if somebody is really obsessed on something like custodial care in the library and 1970s and you have no interest and you can't see any reason why anybody would want to talk about that, find some ways of helping them to move on to your next time. So um, again, there are things to think about in terms of location. You want it to be somewhere that's safe. So um, somewhere that the subject is at ease. Think about the hours that they can come. Um, if it's someone who's older, there may be accessibility issues. If you do it at someone's home, there may be uh, phone ringing, pets, um, a partner, which could help in terms of filling in details, but they also might be more censorious if the partner is, is right there in, in the room. So again, some of the different options you can see on the, on the screen. So of course, if you do a cafe or an office, you're going to have more background noise. So um, anyway, different things to consider. The most important thing, though, actually is doing the research and coming up with the questions before. So um, you need to think about what makes someone's life unique. Um, again, don't forget about the basics, where someone's born, how they were brought up, what were the values that, that shaped their experience. Again, you know, alternating hard and soft questions. Um, it's just like in interviewing for a job, try to aim for those kind of open-ended questions that will allow someone to tell their own story rather than a yes, no. And you should be ready to kind of jump on other interesting areas for um, follow-up. So yes, research is key. Again, you can try to get someone's CV or resume, or if there's someone famous, they might be listed in a who's who, like who's who of librarianship. 
Um, if they've uh, written materials, you can try to track those down. That'll give you a lot of material to talk about. Um, other places like it, find annual reports or articles about libraries or archives where they've worked. Those will all give you different kinds of elements. And then, you know, whether you want to do it, I, I still use little index cards sometimes or scraps of paper. Um, the, the advantage is it's really easy to shuffle, um, but you know you can do this, of course, on a computer if you like. But you would try to think about some sort of way of organizing their life and organizing their questions, such as family, upbringing, childhood, school years, college, LIS experience, assuming you're focusing with a librarian or archivist. And then the main thing is their career. And you have to find different ways of chopping up that, that career. Do you want to do it by their by different positions that they had or different places where they worked? Um, again, those of us, if you're talking with an academic, you know, we know that their usual way of doing is research, teaching, or service. So just to give you an example, I, I thought about like, how would I chop up my story and what would be some things that might be questions. So like if I was doing my own story in the category of like family upbringing, you know, I, I would, these would be some sorts of things that, you know, ideally if you can talk with someone before the interview, um, this will, or, you know, again, you, whether it's through email, you'll have some things about what might be some things that you'll be able to explore that help to shape um, someone. So um, again, you know, different overarching themes, different places. Um, so someone's library work, again, what are their experience? How did, what were the things that, what were their, what were their accomplishments? What were their challenges? That's usually the kinds of things that are going to be most key. So again, like as a professor, again, research teaching service, but then I think it would be really important to talk about like the LIS Ohana and um, what were the, some of the things that were unique about that kind of, of period. And then of course, you know, we're all people besides our professional work and these things have an influence. So, you know, try to touch on some of those things. And what I would encourage you to do um, before you do the interview, and this will help you with the write-up is to put up a chronology. So again, like, so I, this relates to when I was in different schools um, for, for undergraduate master's doctorate. And I was thinking about what was happening in the US and, and world and what was happening in librarianship. And you can find a lot of different chronologies. They're actually um, like Wikipedia has a, a number of them. Um, but the, the, the important thing is to find you know, someone who's working in a labor archive, I would look at what is Hawaii's labor history? Where were the strikes? What were the, you know, retirements or deaths or, you know, kind of major people or presidential campaigns? All of these are going to help you to think about what makes everyone's experience unique. And so that you can tell a really great individual story that's going to be compelling and is going to be, you bring out the, that, that person's real, real strengths. So, um, you, you will want to build up your antenna um, of what is of interest to other people. And, and, and the key part is not just your own interest. So like Dr. Asado and I were working on um, a history of dealing with Nikkei in, in the Great Plains. And I remember we found the oral history of Reverend um, Hiram Hisanori Kano, who was a uh, a uh, priest in Colorado and, and Nebraska. And we're so excited that there was this oral history. And then when you went to listen to the, re the recording, it was somebody who was interested only in religious and it was like all of what is the different belief system? What is heaven? Or I can't remember all of the different things, but, but it was not about the experience of, of Nikkei in those areas, you know, his own uh, internment since he was a, an Issei um, and, and these kinds of things. So again, try to think about of what's interest, not just for yourself. So um, you know, really go quickly. Transcribing is a really key thing. So in the old idea of analog, the you know um, uh, we I once found like a uh, there's like a sewing machine, like a tape player with a foot pedal, so you could slow it down and repeat. This is what people used to do when they were dictating and transcribing letters. Um, my, when I was a doctoral student, I had a really tight budget, so it was originally um, I had a Walkman, and I would wait, <coughs> wait till the batteries would run out, so they would it would go very slowly so I could type at that speed. Um, 
of course, um, then and now there are a lot of commercial services. These are not an endorsement of these, um, but if you look at the Oral History Association, there are a number of different places where you can send out a tape. Make sure again that you have a backup and they will get things for you. There's more fee if you have uh, words that they might not know. And either way, you're gonna have to edit them because they're gonna all come back with, you know, think about how your, your phone does the like like highway, um, you know, pronouncing it like, like, anyway, the, the point is that the, it, it's, it's still going to be a lot of work, even if you have a professional who do, does it. Um, but now with, with digital, it's a lot easier. There's a software, um, Express Scribe, which I think they have a free version that you can download for a Mac. Um, also, if you do things over Zoom, um, you know, you can enable, um, uh, sub uh, closed captioning, which you can then gener export in terms of uh, a different way of transcribing. Uh, same with, with YouTube. Um, so there are different ways. And um, if you get through transcribing, so the Minnesota State Historical Society has these great guidelines, they'll help you to kind of come up with some of the different ways of applying a summary. Um, what are the things that you want to edit out, such as we all do, um, uh, and you know, how some of those kinds of things that we want to remove. So um, we're already at 12.30, so I'm gonna to try to, there are a lot of ethics to, to deal with. Um, the main thing that you need to be concerned with is that your, that your subject is informed about what you want to do um, and that they sign a release form so that you're able to work with it and that you can deposit it in an archival repository and so that other researchers could use it um, you, that you can talk about are they going to be reviewing your draft and um, anyway those kinds of things so of course um, so it used to be a bigger deal to work with human subjects committee um, at UH Manoa at least um, human subjects has waived oral history projects as long as somebody's not going to be you know something that could you know really expose so if there's something that you have to think about you know again think about if something goes online that someone had something that could be that could harm them you know of course you have to be really careful birth dates social security and any you know um, personally identifiable information you want to be careful of and um, I'm since time is really short I'm just going to give you a heads up that the oral history association has these kind of on their website principles and um, best practices so and that includes their statement on ethics um, so it, throughout the process, preparation, communication, stressing, yes, informed consent, um, the core principles of the association, um, how it's a collaborative um, interview process, and then, of course, this last step of, of preservation and access. So that's working with the um, repository to make sure that others can get it. And they also have guidelines for using oral sources, including the ones that you do yourself and lots of good footnotes. So other best practices, um, check it out. There's also this um, uh, Charles Lang Langless had an interesting piece on doing oral history with uh, Native Hawaiians. So if that is relevant to your project, I would encourage you to take a look at that. Um, some great resources. So Donald Ritchie, not the Donald Ritchie, who is a, a Japanese film expert, but Donald Ritchie, who is the uh, Senate uh, historian. Um, I, I have the third edition of this doing oral history is published by Oxford University Press. Um, there's another one which is very similar. It's worthwhile to get the most recent edition because the technologies on these change. And um, already, um, I think Alice shared the link for the Center for Oral History. And with that said, it's 1230 and I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. So I will stop sharing slides and um, Happy to hear your thoughts or questions. So feel free to unmute. Yeah, thanks for the pause. And again, also thanks for coming. I know this is lunch, lunch hour and we have a million things to do. So feel free to write it in text or go ahead and unmute yourself if you have any. Hey, that was really great. I fully enjoyed your presentation. I had a question um, for the Italy um, Centennial Committee. Have what kind of um, stories have you guys collected, or or are looking for to add into the Centennial? 
So for the, um, so actually I taught uh, 612, so uh, history of information and some of the students there did some projects. So our committee hasn't done an individual, um, th these kind of oral histories as, as a project. The idea was that we want to have the membership in, engaged uh, on, because every, all you, you have to have an interest or kind of a passion or at least some sort of curiosity on telling, on, on some sort of story. And so much of our history hasn't, or history hasn't been written. And so, you know, there's, um, you know, I really encourage you to suggest something that you'd like, and we'd have to, to, to go for it. There, we, um, I, there's a few parts, <laughs> whether they're published or unpublished, that could help um, with this story, but we, this, is, this is an open call. Okay. Okay. So thanks, Teresa. All right. Yeah, because I, I, I think I have some some ideas. I work in one of like the older libraries, and so some of our staff have been here many years, and so they've seen the the changes within the library system. So I, I have some ideas. I'll I'll continue thinking about it. Thank you. Great. And and maybe if you could find another person who was interested in working on the in, in the public library system, you could think about. I mean, there. And so part of the. You know, I think about like what are the stories in in their experience, such as like the Baker and Taylor lawsuit or the um, you know Bart Kane and, and, and yes, yeah, sorry, thank you for sh crying. So um, you know, the, you know what are and what are the victories? You know, the, what are you know creating um, new branches and what were the struggles and you know thinking about and sustainability, thinking about the change in. Um, you know, more diverse um, in, in terms of librarians and also in terms of, of leadership. The, I mean, there's so many different things you could go. Maybe the experience of neighbor island public libraries. So part of a, a big thing that you'll want to do is think about how do you, either if you have someone, if, if you know somebody who'd be a great person, you can let that be your engine or you can focus on, um, you know, maybe a certain time, and then that can use that to help you to find other things. But yeah, hi, thanks. For hi, other Dr. questions? Or uh, hi, hi, Dr. Hi, Dr. Jessica. This is Jessica. Thank you so much for this uh, session. I was very excited to see it offered because I, um, I am inspired to do something to do with, you know, I'm currently the bookmobile librarian at Wailuku Library, and there's such a rich history around it, and I've um, just compiled librarian reports from like dating from even the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, and so they're actual annual reports, quarterly reports of past librarians, and I was trying to figure out how to incorporate that into something written, but I'm also interested in interviewing past librarians, you know, um, specifically for Maui, uh, because that's where my passion is. So I don't know if that would be a project that I could embark to contribute toward this project. And with your your help, that would be super awesome. I'd be happy to work with you and, and anyone who's interested in doing this. So yeah, that that's perfect. And, you know, bookmobiles were really, you know, instrumental and, you know, and, and it's kind of spreading the kind of library movement. So there's a whole history of, you know, Maui and how that began you know, state system or territorial system, then an independent system kind of, you know, within the territory, then, you know, so again, there are lots, so that's a perfect idea of gathering those reports, you know, looking in, so public libraries still have vertical files, those are, you know, and, and microfilms, you know, um, there are a lot, that lot of those things are gonna be really helpful in, in telling those stories and then finding names. And, you know, even if you don't get to do a full life, history or history with someone, you know, that can try to help you or, and, and another thing that I forgot to do is that um, talk with users, you know, it, you know, in some community, you know, that, that, that you know, and, and you don't need to talk with a user, you know, like, where were they born, you know, what, you know, but, you know, focus on, on their reading and what did it mean when the bookmobile came to town? Do they remember the sound? Did, you know, is it like the ice cream truck, you know, when it made a sound or, you know, or what did people feel? And, you know, so the more tactile things that you have, if you don't decide to do it as an oral, writing it up as an oral history, but more as, as a, you know, historical straightforward article, those human stories add so much to the value. And, and it helps think about what is unique about Maui and Maui reading and 
in, in most of the communities, probably the, the later setting up of branches in, in that community was they were bookmobile stops, you'll find out, or they had a depository collection and that kind of build up the library kind of belief or habit or those things. So that, that, those, that sounds like a great project. And yeah, feel free, we can do individual Zoom call or something like that to think about strategies. And, and again, that's with, with anybody. So you're helping me to tell this story. You're helping our committee. So that, that's really great. So I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. So then I see um, so Kylie wrote um, in, in the great group, best criteria to select transcript app options. Um, and, and Karina, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I don't know about UH license to any of these. I don't think so, but I think the one that I mentioned is free. So um, the, um, give me a second. So the um, <laughs> Express Scribe transcription software for Mac um, has a free version, I believe. So again, that's Express Scribe transcription software. So if, you, if you're in the PC world, I, I don't know offhand, but... Um, so in, in terms of criteria to, to, to select, so obviously budget is, is something, um, yeah, sorry, Alice, yeah, I, yeah I, I, thank you for checking. I, um, when I should have checked with the Oral History Center to see if they know of anything. They recently moved um, centers. Um, yeah, and thanks for sharing that. So the, the link, Karina. So, um, but part of it is, you know, what you're comfortable with if you use, Zoom and you're going to be like because of COVID, if you're going to be interviewing someone over Zoom, that might be a natural. So again, there are a lot of oral historians because we do things in so many different ways. We're, we're Googling stuff a lot, right? It's like uh, those of us at, at the reference desk or, you know, again, the Oral History Association will have, if you look at the newsletters, you can find a lot of information or, or reviews about some of the things. So like I said, and in some of your projects, like, um, if uh, like like the the Maui bookmobile, you might not be uh, able to transcribe everything. You know that's that's the goal. But maybe your for the first step is going to be doing the interview and then kind of taking out some of the key. You know the kind of more like a journalist. Again, the, the goal for oral history is that we get something that can go into a, an archival repository, but it's not always possible. So other other questions or thoughts. I know we... Aloha, Dr. Wertheimer. This is Kylie. Okay. Um, and so I had a second part to my chat question. Uh, so uh, just shout out to UHLAS class of 94. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Um, but is there an oral history that you recommend would be a really great one to look at that has amazing questions and really amazing footnotes that you know is researched well? Uh, oral histories is something we constantly do here at the Punahou Archives. And so we're always looking for best practices. And I think over time since 1976, we've had really, really great ones that were kind of just so thoroughly done, but were exhausting. And then we had ones that were really, there wasn't any, there isn't any substantive uh, historical information that came out of it. It was kind of like checkbox, we got that guy. But can you think of an example that's available where we could read a really good one that checks off criteria in terms of, you know, you could tell that the interviewer thought of these really open-ended questions, the research afterwards where it was really well done. Um, so uh, actually one thing that I would suggest is that um, there's a, another handbook I forgot to mention in addition, Lorraine Roy uh, edited one that's on working with um, oral, um, Oral history librarians of color. So she's one of the co-editors of. I, I I can't remember the title offhand, but um, maybe someone. Can, I'm trying to find one other thing in the link. Give me just a second. Um, but she th that will be helpful. Um, another e example that I'm going to. Um, one more second. So um, a recent 
uh, graduate, um, Valerie, um, I'll share it in the link, um, did a master's thesis with, with me, um, an interview with um, Ruth Horier. And she did an amazing job on, on that. Um, and she's gonna be contributing. I, um, I have to check with her again. She's in the UK now, um, but you know, working with, with Ruth Horier, she did an intersectional feminist uh, analysis of, of her work you know, as, as a, a Hawaiian language specialist. And you know, again, that kind of all of the different challenges and opportunities and her experience. So, um, it, it, you know, that that, that was a, a whole semester's, I mean, of several semesters worth of projects. So I don't think it's going to be a model for what many of you are going to be doing for this project. Um, but it is a great one to, to look at. Um, and so that would be, yeah, and, and the, it's R.O. Smith and Lorraine Roy had this is probably a more bite size um, and again in the chat this is the book that I mentioned Lorraine Roy and um, A. Aro Smith quoted this capturing our stories oral history of librarianship in, in transition so it's much more about uh, focusing on diversity um, including indigenous um, and so I probably talk about Dr. Roy all the time, but I think it's a great model for a lot of the things that we want to do. It's also a lot shorter. And, and um, A.R.O. Smith was her doctoral student at UT Austin um, and was focusing on, on oral history. So it's, it's a, it'll be a good, good model. I don't know if we have time for one more question, Sharice, or did you want to go and uh, did you say we wrap up usually at, at quarter two? Yeah. Um, well, if anybody has any questions, um, they can contact um, Andrew Wertheimer. Um, we'll probably send out um, a copy of uh, the recording and some of the links that were put into the chat. I um, just want to conclude this program by saying thank you for joining us um, for this month's Next Steps program. Um, the second part of this workshop series will be held on August 24th. But next month, please join us for a um, great program to learn more about Google pro um, productivity apps. And I just wanted to say that today's program was made possible through HLA members like you. And to join or to continue to support HLA, check out our social media. Thank you and have a good day, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks.